you know how in the games there are propaganda posters you can find in specific kinds of locations. There's one in particular that is different than the others. There is a red American propaganda poster painting the Chinese as deadly enemies, which is what propaganda posters are supposed to do. They're supposed to either make the enemy feel very dangerous and motivate the public against them, or they're supposed to make them seem ridiculous or non-human or something like that. In this specific poster, it's red. It's most of the poster is red. In the background, there are what appear to be bombers, military planes in the sky. And underneath them, in the foreground of the image, is a Chinese robot. It looks like the Chinese version of a Liberty Prime, a giant, destructive war machine. And if you look careful enough, behind that first one, there's what appears to be a second. Further back, maybe in the fog, set behind this first war machine, marching, presumably, toward the United States. On the bottom of the image, it says... Their war machine is mobilizing. Let's prepare ours. And you probably are a lot like I am. When you play these games, you notice these things in different locations. You go, oh, that's cool. It's a little piece of history sitting there. Oh, look at this. Uh, you know, What does it actually mean? You don't really think about it too much. You just kind of take it in as a piece of the world. But what this poster is implying is that the Chinese have already mobilized war machines, giant robots, to fight against the United States military. And that might strike you as a little bit odd. What do we know about the Chinese? How do they normally mobilize? And what are they known for across the Fallout lore? Stealth suits, espionage, submarines, the kinds of tactics that don't put them straight up against the might of the United States military, that they were working their way around it. Because according to what we understand generally about the Chinese, they didn't have, supposedly, the technology to pull something like this off. What we know about the conflict in Alaska is that they sent their men across the ocean to attack in Alaska. And if you play through the DLC, you come across a lot of soldiers on the ground. People with rifles marching into battle. And they were met with the American response, which was power armor. And yes, there were regular soldiers as well. But the fact that the American power armor was on the ground at that location, as far as we can tell, turned the tides, or at least helped turn the tides, for the United States in that conflict. Now, the information that we have about that conflict comes from a simulation. That simulation was created by the United States. We seem to be witnessing a version of what may or may not have actually happened then. Was it important to the United States military to take people through an actual realistic situation? Or was it more important to downplay some of the terrible things that actually happened in order to make the soldiers going through the simulation feel empowered against the enemy? The truth may never be known about that, but if it's the second one, then it would make sense why they didn't include these war machines in the actual simulation. So I'm going to posit a scenario here. The Chinese have, of course, designed stealth armor. They have means of espionage, of not being seen, spies, those kinds of things. Of course, we have physical evidence of that. You can find the remnants of Chinese infiltrators and suits of armor and things like that in the games. That is 100% confirmed. 
But what if there's more to it? What if one of the reasons why the Chinese are the last of the two great nations on the planet is because they actually had the technology to do more than what the American military would have revealed in a simulation? What if that propaganda poster is right? What if the Chinese designed and already had used in warfare giant robot battle machines? And there's some evidence for and potentially against this. Let me address some of the against it parts. First of all, they weren't known for this type of warfare as far as we know from the Fallout games 100, 200 years past the date of the Great War. The remnants of that don't seem to reveal it, but think about that for a minute. The locations that we have played games at, whether it's on the West Coast or the East Coast, were not physically infiltrated by the Chinese in a direct conflict sort of manner. If anything, those areas were bombed by most likely planes dropping bombs at those locations or being shot from submarines and things like that. So no boots on the ground there. Or they were infiltrated by stealth soldiers and spies. Again, you wouldn't send these war machines to follow up a secret sneaky attack on mainland USA. So the fact that we don't have remnants of these war machines on battlefields in the United States makes sense because we don't really have battlefields in the United States. We basically have bombed out locations that didn't see the same sort of army versus army altercations like we see in the Alaskan simulation. So as I mentioned before, the Alaskan simulation may or may not be actually real. It may only show a very small piece of the conflict, even if it is real. What if the war machines were a second push into the continent? We don't know. We don't know the details for that side of it. And we haven't physically been there outside of a simulation to see if there's any remnants of these machines on the ground in the future. What actually happened? We don't know. So then let's move over to the question about what we do know. What do we know about the Chinese? Well, the Chinese military had extremely high amounts of manpower in reserve. We know that. Not only did they use stealth suits and other technology like that, but they had more soldiers. And this is something that was well known among American forces. Their population was higher. The number of soldiers they could conscript into the military was higher. And on top of that, we know that they had high-powered weapons they could throw a lot of firepower on a battlefield with a large number of soldiers to man those weapons. This was one of the justifications for developing American power armor to begin with, was to catch up in a way. If a single soldier in power armor was worth 10, 20, 50, 100 other soldiers on the battlefield, then that helped the Americans catch up from like a power standpoint. But you might be saying, wait a minute, I've played Fallout 76. I've seen the Chinese or the communist power armor in the game. I might even rock it myself because I think it looks pretty cool. How does that work? Well, first of all, Fallout 76 may be a simulation. We're not really sure. It is the type of game that draws from all of the Fallout fandom and allows you to role play whatever you want in that world, even though it's only set a few decades after the bombs dropped. So you could make that argument. Hey, this is all fairy tale stuff. It doesn't actually match reality. And that may be the case. But what if it isn't? And I'm not saying that in Appalachia, you have the remnants of Chinese power armor sitting around or being constructed by other people. What I am suggesting is that the existence of Chinese power armor and the designs of it 
in Fallout 76 may reflect a reality that we just haven't seen in the other games. Even if Vault 76 and all of the events of Fallout 76 are all happening in some sort of simulation, that doesn't mean that that simulation isn't based off of something that's also real. For example, they have some of the Ranger armor from New Vegas in Fallout 76. Well, of course, the games existed different time periods in different places. How would somebody in Appalachia a few decades after the bombs dropped have a sense of what somebody on the West Coast would be wearing that's part of the NCR that hasn't even formed yet? The solution for that could be that Vault 76 is a simulation, that it isn't actually only a few decades. The, the setting for the simulation is a few decades after the bombs dropped. But the actual vault itself and the people who are in those simulations exist maybe 200 years after the bombs dropped. And whatever machine or intelligence or individual that is designing the experience for the people stuck in the vault, stuck in the simulation, has awareness of other things. And those other things might be accurate, just like Ranger armor from New Vegas. So in that scenario, the existence of Chinese power armor may not be something that that person or machine cooked up as a possibility. It may be a reference to something that that person or machine actually has real data about. And if that's the case, then Chinese power armor may have actually existed. And it may have actually been used in real warfare scenarios. Otherwise, how would somebody or something in the United States have evidence of what it actually looks like, how it actually functions? Because we don't have information coming back from other locations into the United States after the war. Or at least it's very rare that that happens. And if we take one more step, if the existence of Chinese power armor... And let's say this proves that the Chinese power armor was used in assaults against the United States in places like Alaska, then it's not that much harder to think that this war machine. Let's talk about this communist power armor or Chinese power armor. There are a few variants that do show up in Fallout 76. Their design is particularly interesting. Now, if you look at the models, You'll notice that the lower part of the design, the legs look very similar to American power armor, which may be the case because the Chinese were able to get some pieces and design some things around what the Americans were doing, not necessarily from the remnants of, say, blown out pieces of power armor in Alaska, which there may not have been any. Also, we're assuming that they would have already designed their power armor before that incident, but more likely due to the spying and the subterfuge that gave them insight into American technology. That could be a possibility. So there are similarities here, the hands, the legs. Uh, but if you look at the rest of the power armor from the arms and the chest up to the shoulder pieces, they are very distinct and different. And then when you get to the helmet, the helmet itself, if you compare the way these look, to the propaganda poster are very similar. The star on the chest, the three eyes on the helmet, almost exactly the same as this war machine giant robot. Now, those of you who are skeptical about this would go, well, clearly it's just a meta thing, right? The designers who work for Bethesda in Fallout 76 looked at the poster, they used that as inspiration for the power armor, it makes sense. Power armor is like a robot you walk around in. This is a big machine. They may have similarities in the design. That would totally make sense. Or you could flip that around and go, maybe the posters were right and the Chinese power armor also looked the same because that's something that would make sense if you were manufacturing these robotic parts and you were using similarities in design across these two different things that aren't actually that different. Power armor, just like people walking around in a robot suit. An actual big robot designed, shaped like a person, 
the <laughs> it makes sense that these would look pretty similar. So which one is it? So you may also be asking the question, well, do we actually have any proof that the Chinese did make power armor? And the answer to that is probably not actual hard proof. What we do have is a non-canon reference. In the Fallout Bible, it says, 2067, the first suit of power armor is deployed in Alaska. While lacking the foam mobility of future versions, this power armor is incredibly effective against Chinese tanks and infantry. Its ability to carry heavy ordnance becomes key in various localized conflicts, and it has the power to destroy entire towns without endangering the wearer. This is all stuff we've talked about before in the power ep armor episode years ago. All of that stuff. But then it says, China rushed to create its own versions, but they are many years behind the United States. This is a Fallout Bible entry. Fallout Bible Zero. As we know, the Fallout Bible is not considered canon. It is a collection of information and com comments and things that the original creators of the first two Fallout games had posted online and shared and discussed years and years ago before the actual Fallout 3 was released by Bethesda after they gained ownership of the franchise. This is according to what some of the original creators thought about that situation. But it doesn't mean that in the majority of the time that Fallout has been developed since this point, that that hasn't changed. Now, some of you might be going, oh, well, if it's the original creators and if, it, if it's from Fallout 1 or Fallout 2 or any of the things that they were doing, Van Buren, then it has more gravitas. It has more weight for the lore than anything Bethesda's done because, oh, Bethesda just messes up the lore, all of that. And I get it. Some people have that perspective. The alternate perspective is Bethesda and the game designers since that time have made changes to the lore and have continued to grow the series like many video game series go through. And if it doesn't show up in any of the official games, it's not canon yet. But that doesn't mean that something can't be actually underneath what's going on. So what side do you fall on? Well, we don't really have hard evidence one way or the other when it comes to this. But the idea that the original creators were toying with the idea that the Chinese were actually trying to develop something and seem to be years behind the United States shows that there's, it's a possibility that this is something that could have happened and what if the, the the power armor was the stuff they were having a hard time with? What if an actual automated giant robot was something that they could build, but it took a lot more resources, they could only field so many of them as opposed to smaller designs like power armor suits that they could give to many, many different soldiers. So that's the other perspective on this. Just because, it, let's say this is true, just because they were falling behind when it came to the design of power armor, doesn't mean that the robotics side of this organization, government, whatever, whoever was designing the giant robots, weren't actually making those work. And then that would mean that these war machines may actually exist out there somewhere. Maybe they never made it to mainland USA because they didn't need to. Or maybe they did during the Alaskan conflict and the United States decided to not share that in the simulation. There is a little bit of other evidence as well. The existence of the pulse pistol or pulse guns in the games from Fallout 2 to New Vegas to Fallout Tactics to Van Buren. Now, two of those are canon games and the other two not so much. But let's talk about the pulse pistol. Why would the United States design a pulse pistol if the majority of the Chinese military was men on the ground, tanks, boats, submarines, things like that. A pulse pistol is a small device. It's something that a soldier can hold in its hand. This is not a major large artillery piece that shoots at great distances at large targets. This is a small 
device that individual soldiers or power armored individuals can wield in order to shoot at the enemy. If you're not familiar with pulse pistols, they work kind of like an ion cannon in Star Wars or, or some of these other devices you see in sci-fi where they will neutralize things that run on electricity, especially things like robots, machines that use complex computing in order to function. They basically turn those circuits off through impact. These would not be very useful against soldiers on the ground, and depending on how much computer technology is in the tanks and things like that, and they may not be particularly effective against tanks either, but a giant robot marching on a battlefield? You would want every soldier to have a pulse pistol or pulse gun of some sort in their back pocket. But this brings the debate around in circles again. The general understanding is that the Americans feared that the Chinese were working on power armor and robots and things like this. And so it made sense for them to preemptively prepare weapons to fight against that. That seems like a dangerous tactic, though, if you know 100% that you're going to be putting power armored soldiers and potentially a Liberty Prime out there on a battlefield and your soldiers are going to be wielding pulse pistols. Which means if those soldiers go down on a battlefield and the enemy picks those up, they all of a sudden gain an advantage against the very machines that you're putting on the battlefield. That seems fairly dangerous, unless you are certain that the enemy is going to be marching either power armor or giant robots out on a battlefield. So which is it? Were they preemptively preparing for these things because they thought it could be possible? That seems very likely. Or was there actual real evidence during an early skirmish in Alaska that had the Chinese using something like a giant robot against the Americans and they needed to respond? Which one is it? One seems more likely, but the other seems like there might be enough evidence out there to support that that may have actually been going on as well. Thanks for listening to one of my other crazy theories and, and for being here and supporting the show for, for as long as it's been going. I really do appreciate you listening and being part of this community. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and be careful out there. You never know if you're going to come across a uh, dangerous war machine. I'll see you next time.